Let, let me actually. Oh, wait, did you start it, Archer? Oh, no, Kieran started, I guess. Okay, so, so welcome everyone to this week's Sydney CPPC seminar. So today we are very happy to have Graham White from the IPMU uh, to give us a talk. So Graham has been working um, on baryogenesis, or that's his main field, baryogenesis, gravitational waves, particle cosmology. Um, and he basically did his PhD at Monash University. He finished, graduated in 2017 and the supervision of Java Balas and then moved on to Triumph for postdoc. And now he is at Tokyo University slash IPMU and is working there, but also collaborating with people all over the world. And today he will be telling us about the archaeology on the origin of matter. So please, Graham. Uh, thanks for that very nice introduction. So um, weirdly enough, there's a variant spelling on archaeology, so that's why I've given both spellings. Uh, I thought it's American versus uh, UK, but um, according to Wikipedia, it's not. There's just variant spellings. Um, and as I was saying, this is uh, my institution, um, at least before um, I arrive. Um, and this is what it looks like now. Oh, it's a... Uh, sorry. <laughs> issue with the slides. Okay, this is what it looks like now. Um, and I promise that I'm not to blame. Uh, but this is a um, uh, talk is, uh, I'm going to talk about like a, a pet passion of mine, but also a bit of a hobby. And that is um, just um, looking at um, high scale baryogenesis, where um, it's not the sort of topic where you could really write a grant proposal about or research statement about, because ultimately it's an ideas based um, topic. And uh, where, um, where an idea comes along every um, few years. But the first ever, um, uh, we had uh, earlier this year, the very first ever uh, conference on how to test uh, high scale baryogenesis. And so all those recordings are on YouTube if anyone's uh, interested um, or just some ideas from the field. So I'm gonna talk about three of my ideas on, on, this, uh, on this hobby. And these are the archive numbers if anyone's uh, interested. So um, if you're, uh, don't know about this subfield of baryogenesis. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's motivated essentially by the fact that we have this amazing triumph of cosmology uh, where we know there's more matter than antimatter. We don't see um, regions of matter in the universe and regions of antimatter. We know there really is an asymmetry. And we know that uh, this asymmetry existed um, when the CMB was formed uh, because we can measure it through acoustic oscillations. And we get the same asymmetry if we measure it by looking at um, deutons in the early universe. Um, and so we know that this asymmetry was there in roughly the same value when Big Bang nucleosynthesis was happening. So this asymmetry um, is roughly the same age of the universe at most. It, it is the same age of the universe minus about a minute. <laughs> so you have a very short window in order to get the right baryon asymmetry, probably even less than a minute actually, because uh, uh, you need to time for everything to settle. Uh, okay, so this is um, basically my, um, I, I look at co particle cosmology broadly, so I look at dark matter and uh, worked on flavor physics with uh, uh, Michael here. Um, so, so there's plenty of interest, as, as most of us are, there's plenty of things we're interested in, but baryogenesis is um, really an interest of, uh, of mine and a lot of the field will look at either creating models or uh, look at existing paradigms for um, which are under the lamppost. Uh, so, um, and these, um, so far, they haven't been um, uh, scared off by electric dipole moments. Uh, these are still, still many, many viable models in your main vanilla paradigms, as well as new paradigms coming up every now and then. Um, and, uh, but a big dark um, cloud on, uh, in our field is there's uh, just really well-motivated models um, outside the lamppost. Uh, and those uh, those two paradigms, um, these aren't the only models, but probably two paradigms which are really uh, well-motivated and uh, really successful and really compelling, uh, CISO leptogenesis and affectine. And, uh, and basically these are just models where CISO, you try and uh, link, link to what, what we know, we know that we have a uh, we have a issue where we can't explain neutrino masses in the center model. And the simplest way to do that is just to um, add steroids. And if you do the simplest way of um, solving a neutrino mass problem, 
you get you get led to Genesis um, for free for some parts of the primary space, and so that's very compelling and admittedly a little bit uh, worrying if you want testable physics down uh, under the lamppost. And for Dyne is the naivest way to uh, uh, to connect things to. Well, it's not the naivest way to connect things to inflation, but it is you do kind of use inflation. You have a bunch of scalar fields. The Alfred Dyne field is in the infraton. Um, I don't know if there's any exceptions to that. Uh, there's probably some exotic model out there where someone probably has made the Alfred Dyne field the infraton, but it's uh, at least happening at, in the aftermath of inflation. Uh, yeah, I've Alfred Dyne. Uh, so I explain in a little bit in detail what these models are. Um, but um, if you um, have a look at how far outside the lamppost these are, well, you can get a scale. Um, so if you have your minimal leptogenesis scale, um, well, you have a lower bound, which is um, known as a Casio bound. Uh, that's um, um, five orders of magnitude um, higher than the LHC. And then the upper bound is um, a little bit more frightening. It's 10 orders of magnitude bigger than the LHC. And keep in mind the LHC is the size of a, of a small country like there's i think there's probably kingdoms in uh which still exist in europe which are smaller than the lhc and uh and so if we scale uh that up uh then we get a collider probably the size of the galaxy that's uh just not practical if we want to discover things the traditional way and affleck dyne is arguably even worse so you you're looking at probably between the infraton and the gut scale but uh if anyone's an expert on affleck dyne there might be well motivated ways of Getting out of time feels something much lower, but if you want to, if you want to um, just take things out of the box um, and um, and it, um, and face reality that there are things out of the um, lamp posts, then this is a rough uh, range of scales that you come up with, um, and these are quite frightening for people who want to work in phrenology because they hope to discover something in life rather than um, say formal field theory or string theory. Um, so, um, well, if we can't do uh, collider physics, um, maybe we can do archaeology. And if you think about archaeology, um, you use indirect uh, evidence to get the most plausible information. So you can, uh, if you dig up, um, um, like say, if you dig up, like say, a statue um, of some civilization and it looks uh, anthropomorphic but slightly different. And then maybe you see some uh, dead animals that burns about that. You might conclude that um, quite reasonably that um, that uh, this was some cultic thing that maybe there's some religious thing that had some god which looks like that uh, that particular idol they had. Um, but you don't really get the same guarantees that you would say in collider physics. Um, so I mean, another explanation of that is uh, maybe people had that as some uh, wedding um, ceremony and. And they had a feast to go with that way somewhere. I, I don't know, but like you're not getting the same level of um, certainty. But you, but it's still a science. You're still getting like some information, and you're giving a plausible um, narrative, and you have these indirect hints which give me a plausible narrative. So this is this sort of archaeology we're going to uh, we're going to do. We're going to try and um, indirectly rule stuff out or rule stuff in through indirect observations. And um, and so first of all, let's start with um, something of a nightmare scenario. Uh, so this is um, probably the hardest scenario in order to test. Uh, so this is um, just where you just have completely uh, vanilla seesaw. But all you do is you um, add to the um, um, standard model some right-handed sterols. Uh, this can, this right-handed sterols uh, neutrinos are gauge singlets, so that we're allowed to write a mass term for that. And when we write the mass uh, matrix for neutrinos, we find out that there are um, that the lightest eigenvalues uh, scale uh, inversely with the scale of this mass. So we can explain um, the fact that we have small neutrino masses, so much smaller than the other particles in the standard model, by the fact that we just have a heavy scale in the model. So that's um, a theoretical advantage, but in terms of phenomenology, that's obviously a disadvantage. And the nightmare scenarios, we just say, well, let's we, we can um, we can do inflaton reheating and, and leptogenesis, and I explained neutrino masses, basically everything but dark matter, in in such in such a simple model which uh, which has um, very little testability. So we just add an inflaton, and um, and then we add some reheating channels. So we have the inflaton coupling to the Higgs, and we have the inflaton coupling to the sterols. 
Now, this is actually the minimal um, because if you have infertile coupling only to sterols, then it turns out you uh, radiatively uh, regenerate, uh, radiatively generate the coupling to the heat. And we'll turn to that um, in a moment. And the, re and the reason why this um, uh, is enough for leptogenesis is you actually uh, fulfill all your sacral conditions. So if you're not familiar, you have three conditions which you need uh, in order to uh, uh, get baryogenesis to produce a baryon asymmetry. And the first is you need, um, uh, you need departure from equilibrium. And so your heavy sterols are allowed to depart from equilibrium in the early universe. Uh, you need some CP violation. And so uh, this happens just purely through uh, uh, serial decay into standard model content. So you have your, um, your tree level decay um, interferes with your uh, loop decay because you have the same in and um, out states. And um, and you and you're allowed to put a, um, a phase in some of these couplings, and so you have um, an interference there. And then in terms of um, uh, B violation, where you don't where you have um, you don't have B violation, but you do have L violation. Your M and N turn uh, explicitly uh, violates L by two units, and uh, this L violation can be converted into a um, in, into baryons, uh, so you can get a baryon asymmetry. Ascent, uh, through electric phalons. So electric phalons um, like to relax B plus L to zero. So if you have an L, then you have, uh, then it's going to want to have a minus B and vice versa. And so I said we radiatively generate these couplings. And uh, so the size of these couplings are going to be um, scaling um, um, essentially with the uh, value of your uh, interaction, this is lambda, which is your coupling between your infraton and your stellar neutrino. And, uh, and it's also going to be um, uh, growing with the mass of your um, stellar neutrino. And, uh, and so uh, these are unavoidable. So if you have, uh, if you couple to your stellar neutrino, uh, you produce these. And so, okay, what sort of archaeology can we do? Uh, uh, can we dig a chip away at any of the dirt? So in this case, we're going to um, at least rule out some of um, the scenario as a first step. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, notice that we have a vacuum instability issue in the scenario. And, uh, and so the reason why we have such a vacuum uh, instability issue is because um, the Higgs uh, quartic, um, we know that its beta function is negative. So if you go to high enough scales, it, uh, it, should, uh, it, should, um, it should be uh, changed sign. And so then if you think of the Higgs potential, you have two negative terms at uh, large enough field values. And so that means uh, it's unbounded from below and you have a catastrophic vacuum. And the precise scale at which this happens, it depends on your uh, uh, precise values of your standard model. Uh, and so this is, uh, I think there's been a recent update where things got more unstable before that things got less unstable. And so this is still a story in progress. Uh, but at the moment, it looks like probably, yeah, there's at least some metastability in the center model. Um, and so why this is important is because um, at the end of inflation, the infraton is oscillating and it's um, non-perturbably producing um, showers of Higgs. And um, you can have your Higgs condensate um, reach the instability scale. So when your Higgs condensate um, um, Reach, reaches the uh, instability scale, then we say that that's the time when we have um, uh, vacuum decay into the catastrophic vacuum. And, uh, and, so, and so this um, production, catastrophic production of Higgs, um, it happens during a time scale, uh, it happens for a period of time. And the period of time for which this happens uh, is uh, the period of time in which you have a parametric resonance. Um, and so uh, this uh, uh, resonant enhancement um, uh, in your, this is uh, unstable mode, which appears in your Matthew equations. Uh, so this uh, is a decay time, which um, scales inversely with the, um, uh, so your decay time scales inversely with your M phi and your resonance time scales inversely with M phi squared. And so because they have different values of M phi and they also depend on your couplings, uh, it's very possible for your decay uh, to, be, uh, to be a shorter time scale than the resonance, and in which case uh, your vacuum instability is unstable on that model. Okay, so um, um, so so then uh, what we can do is we can use lattice. Um, we use uh, lattice to get the exact uh, time, so we can analytically 
work out approximations uh, for uh, if we just have a quartic, but we have basically two couplings, which we excite. And so we can uh, use ladders to work out what is the uh, uh, maximum value of these couplings as a function of your uh, inflaton mass. So you have an effective mass in the end of inflation, which is going to be different for different inflaton models. And, um, and then if you have um, uh, uh, this uh, constraint, then we can convert that into a constraint on uh, these, uh, on your, on basically on your sterile parameters. So you have this uh, a constraint on your lambda and a constraint on your, your Kawa couplings and your M1. But your Kawa couplings, because of low energy neutrino data, basically collapse into a um, coupling on M1. Now, these are the most um, conservative constraints we can have. If, if the inflaton couples to highest, uh, to heavier steroids, then you're going to have uh, these uh, M2 in here. And so you're going to um, push up against this uh, down much harder. And so then you're going to have much, much severe constraints. So the absolute best case scenario is um, if you don't want to constrain this model, is so you only constrain a uh, couple to M1. And so this, um, uh, these constraints can uh, then be, uh, uh, since we have to uh, reheat only into the sterile neutrino channel, we can't reheat into the Higgs channel without uh, getting catastrophe. These couplings ultimately have to be small. Uh, we can um, uh, basically convert this, these constraints into a constraint on the reheating temperature and constraint on M1. And these constraints are actually quite non-trivial. Uh, they're in the reach of, uh, for the minimal uh, scenario of uh, neutrinos double beta decay uh, experiments, because ultimately you get uh, constraints up to the inflaton mass, uh, obviously, because you need to be below the inflaton mass. And then you also need, uh, and you also chip off um, actually quite a, the, quite a bit of the high mass region. Uh, what's also interesting is um, if, say, we see um, something in the CMB plane, like some N style R, that will make some, uh, various inflaton models more plausible. Now will give us a value of M at the end of inflation. And so if you have a value of M effective at the end of inflation, then you can also um, um, map what these constraints are. And if the if your value of M at the end of inflation is smaller than say 10 to minus six Planck units, then you actually get more um, uh, severe constraints. Uh, this is complementary with other constraints on vanilla leptogenesis. Uh, and so there was also a, uh, uh, around a similar era to when our paper was published uh, a few years ago. Um, there was this paper uh, which looked at uh, zero temperature vacuum instability. And this just looks at the fact that you have a change in the beta function, uh, which arises from your um, uh, steroids. And even though uh, this, this change in the beta function can happen after uh, your instability scale, uh, because it means you uh, your uh, catastrophic uh, vacuum gets deeper, quicker, your tunneling rate is quicker, uh, faster. And so, um, because you have this um, uh, negative contribution to the beta function. And so you could uh, quickly make um, your, um, uh, your theory unstable. And so you get complementary un um, uh, constraints, which again, rule out some of your higher maths. Here you have ruling out M1 being above 10 to the 14 which uh, is still non-trivial, but then what's also quite non-trivial is M2, I uh, guess quite heavily constrained. Uh, M2 doesn't like to be too much, uh, too heavy either. So uh, in summary of this part, part one, we have a nightmare scenario, and this has a catastrophic vacuum, but we can constrain this model so that uh, if infl inflation on neutrinos is double beta decay, um, so long as measurements of top uh, Higgs continues to tell us that there is an instability scale. We can at least uh, constrain the scenario to see how plausible it is and see whether, and maybe even rule out the most minimal scenario. If the minimal scenario is ruled out, then um, more exotic um, scenarios become more plausible. And so that's how I'd set up an archaeology uh, um, um, argument uh, in the minimal scenario. Uh, before moving on, can I ask one quick question? Yes. So how does neutrino less double beta decay come in? So that must be via the relation to neutrino mass parameters, right? Yeah, so working on this a little bit with Julia Haas, um, it's surprising for minimal leptogenesis in this strong washout regime. It turns out the scale, um, if we see a positive signal or rule something out, is surprisingly high for just if you have like, uh, just um, in this minimal scenario. So you assume uh, you see a signal in the adrenal double beta decay and then look back what phases would be there and what exactly, parameters. Exactly. 
Yeah, or you just rule, or you, alternatively rule something out that maybe even rule out this scenario. Since the rule instability is pushing you down from the top end, uh, neutrinos but double beta decay, can you push you up from, from the bottom end? Exactly how close we are to this parameter space, um, uh, we've only done back of the envelope calculations, but surprisingly, we might actually be able to eat into this parameter space. Um, so you cannot hide in a space, right? So you can, the MEE, the one, one, the EE element could go to zero, right? For normal hierarchy. So is that excluded in your scenario, that possibility? Yes, um, I think for minimal leptogenesis, that's hard, uh, that's hard to do. Uh, but um, I will refer to other experts in, if there's anyone who knows that. Um, um, but, um, but yeah, it looks like um, if you have mineral leptogenesis with just this mineral particle content, that looks like, uh, I don't think you can do that. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, I, I'm not the expert on that. That's, I'm just interested, yeah. Yeah, so okay. like, yeah, but in any case, uh, even if there is some fine tuned part where you can do that, it does look typically like uh, maybe you can actually um, do some severe archeology. span Because if it's fine tuned, then we don't care because like we're like, well, then we're motivated to look at low scale stuff. And maybe maybe the universe is cruel to phenomenologists and maybe there's a fine tuned high scale thing, uh, which is out of reach, but, uh, but then we, we get hope uh, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. uh, so we get a bit of a, we get hope either way. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks. No worries. Yeah, so none of these are no Liz theorems. So like, um, Another thing you can get around this is you can just say, well, there's no instability scale because I just have a uh, stable one uh, at 10 to the nine, which does nothing else and is invisible to any experiment. <laughs> so yeah, that would be awful. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean, like um, that is archeology, span of course, um, that you, you uh, because it's high scale, you say, well, we can't do anything as hard science as, as we do at the low scale where we come up with the most exotic, exceptions to every single rule of thumb people come up with uh, we just say okay what are the broadest uh, claims we can make and uh and and what's the most plausible scenarios we can construct uh okay so then for um um then we go uh have a slightly less horrible nightmare and we um notice that we have a motivation to consider there to be some sort of um uh, extra particle content up um at the seesaw scale and the way we would motivate this is by the fact that we have a hierarchy problem and uh, and hierarchy problems have never caused any problems in predicting new physics at an experiment, right? Uh, so we have a um, hierarchy um, issue between um, seronitrinos and the gut scale in the fact that we basically have uh, perturbativity gets you up to about 10 to the 14 for your sero limits, um, a little bit below the gut scale, but your typical scale is much below the gut scale. Um, and so uh, that scale separation suggests maybe we have a symmetry protecting the neutrino masses. Um, and um, secondly, uh, if we have some spontaneous symmetry breaking, I uh, immediately think, okay, this is um, a um, goodie box for thinking about gravitational waves. And because uh, there's all sorts of ways you can do that. And the amazing advantage of gravitational waves in a, uh, as opposed to methods of looking at the universe um, until uh, recently, is the universe is transparent to gravitational waves and, uh, right back to the beginning. Uh, so it's only transparent to light uh, um, until you get about four million years. So the picture we get in a million years at the CMB, um, we can't go back any further. We can we have modes re-entering the horizon, so there's some indirect ways of them. Uh, maybe look at inf inflation, but um, that's but the in-between in period is very difficult. Um, and of course, BBN tells us what the universe was like at a, minimum, uh, at a minute by looking at the light element abundances. But um, yeah, it's uh, the only way we can go back further is through gravitational waves. And so if there's a spontaneous symmetry breaking happening um, um, earlier, there's two ways it can leave gravitational waves. And the first is the phase transition. It's uh, probably the first thing you'd look at. And the second is the topological defects. Uh, so phase transition, um, there is uh, there was a recent paper which did look at this, um, actually, but you need a, a little bit of fine tuning um, because you need a little bit of supercooling or you need like a fancy potential or alternatively as an alt, um, like a, maybe a conformal symmetry breaking potential. Uh, but this is certainly interesting, um, but um, where maybe you can have like some uh, conformal symmetry breaking 
uh, potential bringing the scale lower. But if you look at typical scales involved in leptogenesis, we know that because we have a broken power law uh, produced by uh, phase transitions, uh, that uh, once you put in uh, the scale with respect for leptogenesis, about 10 to the 9 GeV, we end up with frequencies just beyond um, what we can measure at uh, high frequency detectors, say the Einstein telescope. And uh, so that's, we just miss out. We get something around about 10 to the 8. So principle, you can have like something slightly resonant leptogenesis, which can help us with that. Or alternatively, you can have like some way of, um, um, uh, some way of super cooling. But if we want to do archaeology, we really should be uh, considering the most typical scenarios. And, um, and so our phase transitions, um, uh, maybe though, um, we can eventually look at the uh, typical scenarios if we do um, some high frequency, um, um, if we put, build some high frequency gravitational wave detectors. So here's a plot, which is from a living review that, that was part of, um, very ambitious that we collected all the possible proposals um, of um, high frequency gravitational wave detectors and looked at all different types of signals that you can get. And um, this plot is a, um, a little bit cheery because um, if we plotted the uh, maximum um, strain that we're allowed to have, we never get near the, you, you never get, you never beat the BBN down. I think there's one proposal which is very controversial, which might just touch the BBN down at, um, I think, I think it said gigahertz uh, using super galactic rings and uh, has a lot of skepticism. It's very hard to beat the BBN down, but if we just want to look at frequencies, there's plenty of ideas. And so why can't these be upscaled? Uh, let's find out. So if you're a young researcher, this is a very um, exciting topic to look at. Um, when I was, um, uh, when I did my, uh, when I was in high school, I went to a university uh, for physics outreach and someone told us that the very first uh, uh, particle collider, uh, there's an app, uh, back of the envelope estimate of how big you need to have a 1 GV collider um, near a century ago. And uh, apparently it's the size of the planet. So uh, the LHC is uh, 14,000 times larger than that. It's much smaller than a planet. So this is certainly something which is uh, possible in the next century uh, if you're a young researcher and looking for something uh, interesting to do. But that's very ambitious and that's something we can't do in um, uh, before I retire, I don't think, uh, unless things really surprise us. Uh, but there is another um, area we can look at, which is topological defects. So there's a formal way of understanding topological defects where you look at the homotopy group of the vacuum manifold. And if the zeroth is non-trivial, you get domain walls. The first is non-trivial, you get strings. Second is non-trivial, you get monopoles. Third is non-trivial, you get textures. Um, and um, but that's a little bit of um, uh, abstract. Um, I think most people who work in topological defects have never calculated the top homotopy group of, uh, of a group. I have one notebook which does it once, just so I can say I've done it once. <laughs> but I haven't done it. I certainly haven't gone through all the groups and done this. I looked them up. Uh, so it's, it might be more useful to think of rules as a thumb. And so a rule of thumb for matter breaking uh, for uh, domain walls is have you broken a discrete symmetry? Uh, a rule of thumb for um, strings is um, usually you get these from u1 to z2. And, um, and for monopoles, usually if an sc2 goes to a u1. And uh, uh, so those are the things you usually look for. And it, then you just have to make sure you have a misty. And the thing we should um, raise our eyebrows is basically this U1 to Z2, uh, because um, we have a U1. If, if, um, if uh, lepton number is gauged or B minus cell is gauged, then it's, um, it's uh, going to be a U1 gauge symmetry. And the next thing we should raise our eyebrows is um, apologies for the wall of math, uh, but I'm not going to go too far into the wall of math. But if we look, think about the gravitational wave from a cosmic string, usually if you have a usual scenario, so no early period of matter or kinetic domination, no radical changes in G star, um, if you have a usual scenario, then you basically get a flat spectrum during the entire period of radiation domination, um, where your only parameters are basically your um, your symmetry breaking scale, uh, which is essentially is uh, um, determines the string tension up to some order one parameters, which are parameters from your potential, and um, some simulation uh, parameters, which just affect your um, decay rate to gravitational waves and the average loop size. And uh, and what's particularly uh, useful is this uh, flat spectrum. It grows 
linearly with your um, with your um, symmetry breaking scale. And that's very useful that A, it grows. So it's a UV sensitive um, uh, uh, probe. And, uh, and we have um, UV physics here, which we have high scale physics. And the other thing which is useful is the linear scale, because that means that, um, that we can pro probe a wide range. Our next uh, BBN probes um, 10 to the minus five and, um, and nanograv is just probe 10 to the minus seven in terms of your, um, your peak amplitude um, as a fraction of energy density of the universe that exists today. Um, but um, so there are some experiments, including experiments which didn't exist when we did this, um, which are proposed, which go down to 10 to minus 17. So you're looking at, uh, in theory, you're looking at um, 10 orders of magnitude of range in which uh, you can probe with a uh, future experiment. And so secondly, uh, uh, the next observation, which we want to find, uh, which we want to note, is uh, just that these are common. So here's a toy picture of how common these are. Um, in our latest paper um, called uh, Gravitational Wave Astronomy, we look at how common these defects are, um, looking at all 800 um, symmetry of breaking paths. There's a lot more symmetry breaking paths technically than we show. Um, and so we constrain, um, maybe there's an uncountable, maybe there's a countable infinity symmetry breaking paths if, you, if you're really unstricted. But if you have some restrictions on your theory, there's like, you get into the hundreds. But here, let's just look at something toy. And uh, so we have a look at, uh, you have an SO10. Uh, so we have at most rank five. Um, and we have, um, uh, and we only non anonymous with, um, with uh, standard model uh, fermions and, um, and neutrinos and uh, right hand neutrinos. And then we um, also want inflation to wipe out the magnetic monopoles. And then we also want um, the, uh, the symmetry breaking path, which gives uh, the symmetry breaking step, which gives you right hand neutrino mass. That needs to happen after uh, inflation because we want leptogenesis to happen after inflation, not much use happening beforehand. And then we want to rule out um, uh, symmetry breaking paths which have stable domain walls because those are unviable because we don't see domain wall domination. And, uh, and then we want to um, highlight all the symmetry breaking paths which have cosmic strings. And so these are uh, basically all your blue paths plus um, uh, the um, um, plus the um, brown path, which uh, goes to G uh, S M cross Z two, which is um, a texture, and uh, uh, all these paths uh, that that just has two uh, defects in that path, and so all these paths are, are the majority of paths which are viable, um, and they all give you a, um, a, a defect. So we can say if we're doing archaeology that we have to be uh, more likely than not in order to produce a, produce something uh, produce something that you see. Um, and then also we have a little bit of no lose. Uh, there's a recent paper by Stephen King and Jessica Turner. Uh, there might've been other authors, um, apologies if I missed them, uh, which showed that these black paths actually are ones where you expect proton decay. So you either have proton decay or you have these cosmic strings. And, um, and what's um, super useful here is that this, um, um, is that these, um, uh, gravitational waves, uh, if we look at all um, possible future detectors and the complete range of um, neutrino mass uh, uh, scale relevant to um, CSO leptogenesis, we find that you probe pretty much the entire parameter space uh, with future gravitational wave detectors. And so we can actually get more information if we consider hybrid uh, topological paths. So here's another toy um, um, uh, case, which we are, uh, where we have like the very similar diagram, but here we mark um, all, all the cases where we have strings which are attached to walls and monopoles attached to strings. We have these hybrid defects. So the thing which is interesting about hybrid defects is hybrid defects are unstable. And so uh, the reason why they're unstable is if you have um, say, for example, monopoles attached to strings, uh, then depending on exactly how your symmetry breaking paths happen, you can either have a string network which tunnels monopoles uh, and a tunneling effect where you have the monopoles uh, actually remove, um, uh, cut the string and then the uh, string collapses and, um, and then you destroy the string network. 
Alternatively, you can have a monopole network and these become the ends of the flux tubes and those flux tubes are the strings and the strings will mop up your uh, monopoles and actually as a solution to the monopole world. Um, you can have um, domain walls um, um, actually uh, destroy your string network so they can uh, form as flux sheets uh, in between your uh, uh, in between your strings and uh, destroy domain work network. And then the fourth option is you can actually have like a domain wall tunneling a string. And so all four of these are distinguishable. Uh, so the monopole is eating a string, uh, string network. That decay rate depends on the string size. And so you end up not uh, you end up with a slow, uh, a slow collapse in the infrared detail where some of your um, um, where it doesn't um, collapse as fast as causality bounds. So you have an F squared in your in your infrared part of your gravitational wave spectrum. A uh, strings eating your domain walls, so uh, that's much faster. So your domain walls actually collapse things uh, very quickly, and so you reach the causality bound. And so you have an F cubed in your infrared and an F to the minus one uh, in the nucleation case. In your domain wall uh, walls eating uh, string collapse, you have actually an F cubed followed by uh, a plateau from your um, from your um, from just when you have string domination. And actually in the U, in the UV, some, there's some parts of the parameter space where you also get a bump as well in your string um, from where you have a brief period of domain wall domination. And then finally, your strings in your monopole, unfortunately this is a high scale thing, but you get a burst, uh, which appears, um, appears uh, at gigahertz, uh, which is F cubed and followed by F to the minus one. So what's interesting about this is all the all four gravitational wave uh, spectrum are distinguishable. So if we do see this, we'll get more information about what symmetry breaking path. And between all the, between uh, this and perhaps some between double day decay uh, measurement, the scenario starts to get more plausible. Um, so the hierarchy between C scale, uh, summary part two, the hierarchy between the C scale and um, and the gut scale suggests that maybe you have a symmetry protecting our B, B minus L, which might get spontaneously broken in the other universe. If you organize these symmetry breaking paths, you find out that strings are very, very common and that these and that uh, the complete range that we're um, interested in for thermoleptogenesis is observable with future uh, gravitational waves. And hybrid defects give you more information on your symmetry breaking path. So, and your symmetry, uh, because the symmetry break, uh, the signal for each of your hybrid uh, 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 types is distinguishable. So, uh, in summary, there's, uh, there are some very plausible and generic uh, discovery channels for which we can see um, uh, see leptogenesis. So uh, any further questions before we go into the final part, which is after time? Okay, so the final part, which is after time, uh, this is um, long thought to be untestable. And so here we notice that Susie has very flat directions, which uh, violate B, uh, B or L. And, um, and, um, and some of these directions violate B or L. And these can, uh, and we expect uh, at the end of inflation that uh, all uh, your fields have uh, some field excursion. And, uh, and then at the end of inflation, you'll want to uh, wind down um, towards its minima. And uh, as, this as this is winding down, um, if you have a CPU violating operator, this can give it a um, bias in which direction you wind down. And so you can get um, some, uh, you can produce more charge than anti-charge. And so you satisfy all your um, stack rock conditions. You have CPU violation, you have um, a departure from equilibrium, which is this uh, uh, winding down of your field and the, uh, and the production which comes from that. And then finally you have a, um, uh, and finally, you have B or L violation from the fact that you have uh, that explicitly in your uh, flat direction. So it's elegant but difficult to test. And so I'm going to make some fairly generic comments. And uh, the first comment I'm going to make is that these flat directions, they're flat, <laughs> obviously. And so if they're flat, uh, that means they, their flatness can't be spoiled by some Coleman Weinberg um, um, interaction. And common Weinberg um, interactions, loop interactions can spoil the flatness of direction if you have large couplings. So you don't want any large couplings. So decay to particles is expected to be slow. Um, and so that means that we expect that probably um, fragmentation to cue balls is probably going to dominate. Secondly, um, we note that um, these um, uh, 
uh, the cue balls are allowed because we have a flat potential. Again, going back to the flat potential. So for those who are not familiar with uh, cue balls, if your potential grows slower than quadratically and you have to conserve charger, it's uh, energetically more favorable uh, to have extended um, uh, extended field, uh, have all your quanta in these extended field, then have the same number of quanta um, as free particles. And you can see that uh, pretty trivially, uh, if you calculate the, uh, the amount of energy in free particles, it's just um, the mass of the, uh, it's, it's bounded by the mass of those particles, um, uh, if, you, if there's zero kinetic energy, times um, the charge, um, so the number of quanta. And if you want to know the uh, extended particle, well, if you're going slower than quadratically, then you have the basically the um, uh, the curvature of the field at, um, at that field value times the number of quanta, but you're going less than quadratically, so that's less than the mass. And so, uh, and then third, and so you're allowed to have these cue ball, and so that's going to dominate uh, most of the energy from your alpha is going to go into your cue ball. And simulations show that this uh, these cue balls uh, they have a large symmetric component. So uh, there's a lot of energy in this and it has to go somewhere. And we know that we have um, um, a small barrier symmetry. It's 10 to the minus 10 um, or 10 to the minus 11, depending on how you're normalized. And, um, and this is, um, and so the energy has to go somewhere. And so it typically goes into your symmetric component. So your initial en energy density in the cube walls is large. Uh, and, uh, this uh, we can rescale uh, in terms of your um, how much charge is in each of cue balls. If we assume that we have a large, if we uh, take for granted that we have a large energy density, that ends up uh, meaning that uh, we end up with a large, um, a large charge. Uh, how large? Well, it's um, a bunch of order one factors um, times um, the Planck mass cubed over the um, over the reheating temperature cubed. And so the next uh, generic comment we're going to have, since we're doing uh, archaeology, I'm not going to mind if it's, anyone can think of a clever exception to this. I'm just going to say this is generic. Is that uh, that we have a gauge singlet, uh, and we have B minus uh, B and L uh, conservation, and those two facts, particularly the latter fact, mean that decay into gauge bosons is no go. And so that means that we're going to decay into fermions. And so fermions are, um, so we're not going to decay into gauge bosons. We're not going to decay into uh, scalar fields. For example, if you have stop as a component, stop can't decay into stop. Um, and then, um, and so basically we're going to dominate into our decaying into fermions. And, and so uh, this means that um, uh, if we uh, decay into fermions, you either have two options. So your kinematic, uh, 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 forbidding from decaying to fermions in the center. And that happens quite a lot because often your, um, your potential is so flat that your omega, your uh, energy in your quanta is much smaller than the, um, than the value of the VEV. Um, many orders of magnitude are smaller than the values of VEV and you just get kinematic blocking, even if you have like electron you can to uh, save you. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, if you're not in that part of the parameter space, you still have power blocking where the Fermi C fills up, so you decay into fermions for a while, but then your Fermi C fills up, and so you have to decay at the surface. So if you're decaying at the surface, you have an early period of, uh, uh, if you're decaying at the surface, that means two things. That means your decay is slow, and so that means your cue balls are going to stay around for a while. And then secondly, that means that your decay, once it starts, is going to accelerate because your surface of volume suppression changes as you, um, uh, as you get, um, as you um, shrink. So, so because they're slow um, and these are red shifting like matter, you're eventually going to dominate the universe. There's already a lot of energy density in these cue balls near almost as much as there is in radiation. Um, but then, so you're going to have like an early period of matter domination, but then that period of matter domination um, is going to have a very, very sudden transition because once these start to melt, they melt very, very fast, faster than exponential uh, decay. And so what happens if we have an early period of matter domination by a sudden transition is that um, during matter domination, the scalar perturbations, they grow. Um, however, um, if you decay fast enough, these perturbations can't melt away. And so they produce sound waves um, uh, in the plasma. And if you produce sound waves in the plasma, if you just write your Einstein equations, 
you find out that you get a source um, and that uh, source is um, in resonantly enhanced um, when your gravitational waves is going at a particular um, um, angle such that you get uh, constructive interference with the sound waves. And so you get this resonant um, bump in your gravitational waves. And so you need an initial gravitational waves um, to start with, but that's okay. You get that always from inflation. It's just very, very small, like 10 to minus 20. So you, you always, even if R is very, very small, uh, you always get like this very, very large, a uh, very, very small gravitational wave. So for resonantly enhancing that, that, then that gives us something we can see. So let's put, put this in something solid. We're gonna choose a gauge mediated scenario. We're going to have, uh, and we're going to just choose things, uh, choose our scales of our problem between the infraton and the gut scale, like we promised. And then we're going to choose a reasonably low reheating temperature motivated by the Gravitino problem. But um, this isn't too critical. You can move these up a few orders of magnitude and you'll still get the same results, a similar results to what we found. And then we're going to take um, some, uh, some, um, uh, values, um, some benchmark values, uh, which we're going to just take couplings from the standard model, but we're not going to choose the top coupling, um, essentially because um, with the top coupling we have, um, we worry about spoiling the flatness and potential through loop corrections. So, um, but anyway, all that does is you just gradually sh uh, shift um, your benchmarks to the right, um, not in a mo mo necessarily monotonic rate, rate because you have to do a scan and there's lots of randomness in this, but typically these are uh, larger the coupling, the more you shift this to the right. What's interesting is that it's very easy to find uh, parameters which are in the uh, detectability range for LISA. So uh, what sets this uh, scale is the, uh, is the scale at which you um, uh, decay to um, uh, these cue balls, decay and ra radiation domination begins. So, um, and so the reason why you often get a low signature, even though this is high scale physics, is because the fact that these cue balls are long lived, that ends up um, bringing uh, the high scale down to a low scale signature. It's not actually the, um, the, the value which these cue balls form, which is a high scale value, which sets this uh, frequency. It's a value which they decay. And so you buy quite a few orders of magnitude and, uh, and even if these are decaying at the um, at the uh, say um, say thousand TV uh, level, you're still going to see something which is at the edge of cosmic this explorer. So generically, you are going to see something which is uh, visible. So it's very and secondly, you can say, well, we saturated, um, we made these very large signals here. Um, how uh, how hard do we have to try to do that? Well, we did have to try hard. But we had to try hard not to get a large signal. We have to try hard to make sure that we live long enough, uh, uh, so that we live short enough, uh, the cue balls are short enough that we don't enter the nonlinear regime. Now, there's nothing wrong with the nonlinear regime. It's just hard to predict what happens in the nonlinear regime. We have some ideas on how to approach that approximately, but uh, you're still going to get a signal. It's just we can't predict what that signal looks like. So, distinguishing from other cosmological scenarios, so there's many causes of matter domination. But you can't just have a generic period of matter domination. You have to have something decay faster than exponential. To make that decrete, uh, concrete, suppose you have like a period of, uh, suppose you have a bunch of particles which, um, which uh, go non relativistic because they have a slow decay rate. And uh, the decay rate equals Hubble time. Uh, then those decay rates are going to go exponential uh, decay rate. And you're going to have like a very small uh, signal. You need, uh, the, the signal grows the faster this decay rate is. The secondly, second thing is here, we fudge things a little bit uh, in the fact that we considered a step function, but the exact, precise details of the decay rate do affect the height and kind of like the shape of this, um, of this decay rate. So you can, maybe uh, we can distinguish this from PBHs, but that requires a little bit of detail in going beyond the step function approximation. And the other th area where we may be able to distinguish is that we essentially have a mass spectrum if you have like some early period of PBH domination. And in cue balls, we have a charge spectrum. So maybe we can distinguish these two uh, uh, this, uh, signals by considering finite width to the spectrum. We considered a monochromatic width. So there might be ways, and these take this with a grain of salt of distinguishing things, but at the moment, there are two well known um, cosmological scenarios, early period of PBH domination and early 
keyboard domination, which we can distinguish, uh, which we can limit it uh, down to if we see this gravitational wave uh, signal. But we need detailed simulations and scans in order to know exactly uh, more details about how much more uh, scenario distingu uh, distinguishable ability we have. So in summary for part three, we have um, this affleck is an elegant paradigm for explaining the matter antimatter asymmetry, but it's notoriously difficult to test. But we argue that it generically produces long-lived key walls that leave a gravitational wave signature. And there are a limited number of cosmological scenarios uh, that do this, and there might be uh, methods that distinguish signals. And this may be, might be complementary to other probes of affect time. So in summary, there are two min very minimal and compelling high-scale paradigms of the leptogenesis. They're difficult to directly test. We need to do archaeology, where we do what, what's the most plausible, what's the most generic scenarios, and what are generic predictions and things that we can see. And if we see those things or rule them out, the scenarios become plausible or implausible, much like in the field of archaeology. Instability seems to be a very good uh, handle for attacking things, which can be complementary with inflationary observables and nutrient sub or beta decay. Uh, gravitational waves appears to be a very good handle for affect iron and gut leptogenesis. All right, thank you. Uh, does anyone have uh, any questions? Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, questions? Who wants to start? Maybe I, I, I can start us off while others are thinking. Can, can you go back to that slide 37? So basically, as I see here, your slide numbers on the left, yep. uh, where, where you have to figure with the gravitational wave signal. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, what, so you basically those cue balls um, de decay away or melt away um, at a late time. Uh, so what, what are the temperatures which correspond to those kind of scenarios here? So is it, TV yeah. scale, or is it lower, or is that? Yeah, all these were, I think they're around TV. Let me just um, look it up. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That's... Yeah, one second, sorry. Um... Yeah. And, and, and this, the second thing is, but what would be the lowest which you can go? So, so I guess before BBN, you have to make sure everything thermalized and you don't affect BBN in some case. Could, could you go lower than the TV scale or kind of to even TV, few TV, or is it? Um... Well, well, it's linear scaling with the temperature. So um, so basically we're gonna to have to multiply whatever I tell you here gives you this. Um, um, uh, one second. Okay, you got the paper up. Uh, now pulling up. So these were, um, okay, so, yeah, so this, okay, so these were between 100 GV and a TV is this range. Okay, okay. So, so they're pretty low, right? Yeah. And so that means, okay, so this is a TV, which is 10 to the minus two, and we can go to 10 to the three while we can still see things. Uh, so that means we have five orders of magnitude. So we can go 10 to the five TV um, mm -hmm. as your final decay. And then um, if this is hundred GV and this is 10 to the minus four, uh, then we can go to, um, um, then presumably we can go linearly down to, um, it's approximately linear, I should say. There's mm -hmm. like lots of other factors. Um, then we can go to um, uh, five orders of magnitude down, which means we can go, yeah, basically to BBN. Uh, BBN will go into the SKA and Theo region. Um, and so that would be, yeah, the latest, yeah, the detectability range roughly corresponds to the, um, um, to the BBN range. Okay, okay, thanks. No worries. Um, other questions? Uh, I, I have more, I have more. Um, more the so, better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so one thing actually to your second part of your talk, there was a, you made a quite strong statement, right? So in, the, in your summary, so you said kind of the size of the gravitational wave amplitude for all parameter space relevant for thermal leptogenesis is covered by future observers. I should say almost, the word almost. Oh, yeah. Almost, almost, okay, okay. So, so, so uh, okay, is that a corresponding figure? Yeah, yeah. We look at so so. Can you explain it a little bit more? 
Yes, yeah, so your this is the seesaw scale. Um, mm -hmm. So, oh, but I don't think I see your cursor. So you mean on the right is the seesaw scale? Yes. Yeah, so the... yeah. So this is seesaw scale. So we go ten to the nine to ten to the fifteen. So mm -hmm. the cursor above down gives you ten to the nine, and yeah. uh, and then you can go ten to the fifteen. The ten to the fifteen is pushing it because that's a bit kind of yeah. Then the neutrinos get too light, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is um, uh, roughly. Um, yeah, roughly the range uh, that we uh, that we're interested in, and we kind of like just don't get the you know. There's some pessimistic assumptions here. Realistically, ten to nine sh could be visible, um, uh, but yeah, um, yeah. So you you get you definitely get like ten to the nine and a half, roughly to ten to the fifteen. So roughly the Castle Bar range. Um, okay, okay, and, and basically you assume vanilla. Standard leptogenesis. So, so the second one is sufficiently heavier. There are no resonance effects and no, no nothing. No flavor effects. No, nothing. Right. Yeah, so that I'll just wave my hands and say archaeology. So we want what's generic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's fine. That's fine. I just want to uh, understand it basically. But... It'd be very cruel if resonance leptogenesis was true, but I need to bring it down to ten to the seven. <laughs> true. True. <laughs> true. True. Okay. Okay, and there you, there you see that. So, so you have that relatively flat spectrum, and then it's um, so. So, uh, if if I look at a frequency range, there's a bump at the smaller frequencies, and then what what happens at the larger frequencies? So, if you if you go to the right of the figure, does it then go down? It should go down at some point. What what, what sets those scales for the frequency of the gravitational waves? Yeah, there's cool, really cool burst effects are like before you hit the scaling regime and all sorts of weird stuff which happens like at the far right uh, is in the ultraviolet. Um, yeah, but um, we just did the um, low frequency here. Um, but yeah, there's some really funky stuff which happens actually at the UV. Uh, to be honest, I'm not that familiar with it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like just near the string formation, um, while strings are forming and reaching the scaling regime, um, some funky stuff happens, but as long as your gravitational wave is produced by being in that radiation domination, um, mm -hmm. then you get, yeah, basically you get flat. Okay. If you regime yeah. and your matter the radiation domination, I should say, and G mm -hmm. stars constant as well. Ah, yeah, of, of course, yeah. yeah. But, okay, that's that's good. Um, maybe let, let let's. Um, I'm seeing that some people already had to leave. Maybe let's close the formal part and I thank you for once more very much.